How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. we got a very exciting show here today because we will be joined immediately when we come back from the break by good old JR. Jim Ross is joining us here for the entire show. Obviously, new book out, Under the Black Hat. We're going to be talking about that book as well as AW and everything else. No phone calls for Jim Ross today. i got a million questions for him. But if you'd like to send text messages, you may do so. 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Any questions you have about the book or AW or his time in WWE, whatever is on your mind, you're welcome to give us a text message question here into the bin today. Since he's going to be on the entire show, just want to very quickly mention a couple of news notes. Last night on Raw, they did in fact have wrestlers in the crowd. They put up these giant plexiglass deals and they put the fans in the crowd. And I've been told that plexiglass may be permanent, even when actual fans come back to the building, but the show is a million times better. Obviously, the one negative is that they didn't test everyone for coronavirus before the show. They just did the temperature checks as everybody was on their way in, and those are, I don't want to say they're useless, but they're the next thing up from useless. So why WWE is not doing full-on COVID testing? A billion-dollar company, I have no idea. But as far as, like, the atmosphere of the show... A million times better, and I hear they're going to do it for NXT as well as SmackDown, so that is at least positive news if you are a fan of the shows. Matt Riddle likely heading to SmackDown could be as early as this week. He is going to be written out of storylines on NXT, heading to the main roster. Also great news if you're a fan of Matt Riddle. And that's the majority of the news. More later tonight, also last night with Dave Meltzer. But in a moment, Jim Ross talking under the black hat. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Very happy today to be joined by good old JR Jim Ross. Live here, Sports Byline USA, twitch.tv slash F4W video. Under the Black Hat is the new book. You can grab it at Amazon.com. Find booksellers everywhere. Links on my Twitter, JR's Twitter as well. And Jim, how you doing today? I'm great, Brian. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Yeah, no problem. We've got uh, AEW coming up tomorrow, obviously. We're going to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into the book. But pay-per-view this past Saturday night seemed to get some great reviews. What were your thoughts on Double or Nothing? Well, for my role, uh, that's all I can really speak accurately to, I guess. Uh, I had, a, I, it was, The show was a lot of fun to call. There was, was a lot of variety. Uh, you know, the, the last match was a spectacle, a cinematic spectacle, uh, which seems to be a trend or maybe a trend or maybe not, but it, it looks like it's becoming a trend. Uh, I thought we had some real solid matches prior to that. Uh, the guys told, worked hard. That's always been my criteria is that, you know, sometimes creative is so subjective, but effort and desire to perform and give the fans their money's worth isn't. Uh, that's, there's no room for discussion in that deal. So I thought all of our guys and gals uh, worked hard. And, uh, you know, so I, I enjoyed it. It was a good Saturday night. It was a long Saturday night. I think I went to bed about 5 in the morning, but it was a, it was a hell of a night, I can tell you that. Now, you obviously have been around forever in a million different places, and you've seen a million different things and experienced a million different things in wrestling, but nothing like the coronavirus pandemic. I think that's pretty safe to say here. And I I guess the, the first question regarding that would be, what are your thoughts on some of the positives that, maybe not positives, but... Obviously, we've got some, and there are some positives. The cinematic, like the stadium stampede, I'm not sure we would have had something exactly like that if there had not been a pandemic. And people are having to work a little bit differently because there are no fans. I mean, what have you learned from this pandemic? What have you seen that, if anything, has been sort of a positive that people have learned about wrestling and fans as a result of all of this? Well, from the beginning of the virus, uh, to be honest with you, I was skeptical that it was going to be as uh, uh, 
uh, widespread and powerful as it has become. But I soon, uh, you know, smartened up to that situation. You know, my, my, I have two granddaughters, Brian, and they lost their grandpa, the other grandpa, uh, my, my son-in-law's father, uh, took the coronavirus on Easter Sunday. So me coming down to Jacksonville, which is where I am now, and by the way, if you're looking for a weather report, it's running like cats and dogs. Oh, man. Uh, no, no, no beach activity today, uh, as if I needed that. But nonetheless, uh, the virus is going to change the way we do everything. Now, there are going to be exceptions. I overstate. I'm a wrestling announcer, so I dramatize things. I embellish. But I think many important facets of our life are going to be changed for the rest of our lives. And I do think that somewhere along the way, fans get back to the, in the arena. When? Who the hell knows? Uh, you know, we're here at Davies Place. This is, our, this is our site right now. This is where it seems like we're going to be until we can go back on the road. I don't know that. That's, to me, it would be logical. Everything's here. So, uh, but you, everything's changed. You know, the uh, the talents have got to work more snug and more logically. Uh, they can't communicate as, in verbal form as, as freely as they have been used to in the past. Uh, so, it's like the USC fight I went to uh, a week ago here in Jacksonville. Those four-ounce gloves, no fans, make a very disturbing noise. It's a different game. You can hear the coaches. You can hear the announcers. You hear everything. And so now the mics pick up everything. So you've got to be careful what you say, profanity-wise, spot-wise, whatever the heck it may be. But it's, it's changing everything, Brian. And I, you know, I, I, here's an example. I flew from Oklahoma City to talk to Atlanta uh, early in the month, like the third or fourth. I've been here, I've been here all month. And... I rode from Atlanta to Jacksonville with, with Tony, with Shivani, and we had some of that content on our ad-free shows, which is, you know, a, a cluster. But nonetheless, it was what it was. It's kind of funny. Uh, and so I've done a lot of things. I don't, I'm not even staying at the team hotel. I'm not, I didn't go near the, uh, the, the hotel here in town that at one time was housing all the USC fighters and the AEW guys, gals. So, uh, I stayed away from that place. I haven't been there once. So I got an Airbnb and I'm, t- I'm isolated. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being very careful. But the talents have got to observe the new rules. It's like the Bill Maher segment, you know, new rules. There's new rules in pro wrestling. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that about having to hit everybody a little bit harder and having gone to that UFC show. Dave and I used to go to UFC shows all the time. And that was one of the things you would be sitting there and these these guys would be pounding on each other, and it would just sound so brutal. And then you go home and watch it on television, and it didn't really translate because you've got all these these fans in the building. And now, I mean, man, you watch those UFC shows, and you hear what you hear if you're at ringside, and sometimes it's it's pretty disconcerting. And it does lead to, obviously, some some ideas for pro wrestling. I mean, you don't really want to hurt your opponent, but, I mean, you can... As the old saying goes, you can hit people hard in safe places, and it's significantly right. more effective now with less fans than it was back in the day when everyone's screaming and you were getting hit in hard. You were getting hit hard in same in in safe places, but like nobody knew about it except for the ringsiders and the people in the ring. Now everybody knows. So there are tricks that I guess people are starting to figure out about how to work with with no fans. And it's, and it's a brand new game for a lot of guys. You know, you get veterans like Jericho or Moxley. Uh, you know, Hoyt, Lance Hoyt, Brody Lee, those guys have been around. They've been in bigger, they've done all these things. A lot of the guys, uh, a lot of the other guys and, and ladies on our roster haven't had that experience yet. They've had packed houses at PWG or they, they've been on, a, on an ensemble cast in, the, in, in Japan. But, you know, you look at the raw numbers of those Japan cards, except for the, uh, the, the Tokyo Dome. They're, you know, a, a great house is what, five, ten, twelve thousand, maybe? Is that, is that about right? Uh, so it's a, it's a new world for a lot of guys. So then you take, we had a great crowds coming, our TV audience is growing, they're loud, they're boisterous, they're young, they're defiant, it's fun, fun, like attitude error type guys. They're uninhibited, and it's wonderful. But now we got to learn new things. And for me as a broadcaster, 
I can't be wandering looking at the crowd, that pretty girl sitting over there, or somebody's got a cool sign, or somebody's wearing a JR t shirt, which I've never seen. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I jest, kind of. Uh, but, you know, you, you watch the, you, you're frozen to your monitor. And that's really how you broadcast. If you're broadcasting video, you, you, you rely on your monitor's images to be able to pair up your lyric to that music. So there's a lot of things. We've all had to learn different things. And, and I don't think, and we're certainly not through learning because this, this thing seems to be far from over. I, it, it's just that big events are not being rescheduled with fans in mind. And that's so scary. Big events in the mainstream sports world. You know, you're going to have the Masters in like October with no fans, I guess. So I don't, until I see some fans back in America and how that's managed, there's no reason for us to leave Jacksonville, at least in, in the, no, no hurry to leave until it's safe. we got about one minute before this first break right here, but I want to quickly ask you, as, as somebody who was – very involved in WWE, knowing everything about the WWE developmental process and just the WWE schedule. I mean, you mentioned the young wrestlers in, in AEW, and there are a lot of them. And the one thing with AEW is there's no touring. I mean, obviously, the, no one's touring with coronavirus. But, I mean, coronavirus aside, there's there's no house shows. There's no touring. What are your thoughts on the inability of those younger wrestlers to be able to work three or four days a week? I mean, there's there's positives to house shows, and there's also negatives due to the schedule. But very quickly, what are your thoughts on on should they be doing more house shows for everybody's learning abilities? Absolutely, and I think that's the plan. It's just, you know, timing is... I know that there were some, house, some live events canceled into the schedule before the virus. Uh, you can't get better working one night a week. Nobody. I don't care who you are. There's a there's a, there's some minor exceptions. Like I don't know that Chris Jericho needs to work four or five days a week to be great. Doubtful. I think he can be great on, uh, on Wednesday nights. But a lot of guys need to continue to work, and they need to work under the supervision of the coaches in AEW so that they can continue to learn, relearn some of the fundamentals. Primarily slowing down, using more psychology, and selling. Because you've been in the business ten years doesn't mean you're a ten year veteran. It means you could it could mean You've had the same experience 10 times. So, yeah, getting house shows are important for us, I think, to develop talent, especially, and for revenue uh, going forward. But who the hell knows when that's going to be? It ain't no time soon, apparently. All right, back in a moment, everybody. We'll talk Under the Black Hat. Jim Ross is our guest, Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Jim Ross is joining us here today. Under the Black Hat, his newest book, Available right now, Amazon.com. I presume find booksellers everywhere, and despite the fact that I guess all these booksellers are not open right now, but Jim, tell us a little bit about this second book. Then we're going to get in some questions here. Well, you know, Brian, the we, it, the book came out at a very unique time, considering the virus and it shut the doors to a lot of Barnes and Nobles and other books and millions and stores like that. You could also get a signed copy at my website, which is JRS bbq.com jrbbq.com uh the first book i, I paul o'brien i wrote it like a uh a, an episodic television show we wanted it to have some symmetry and so we did that by adding, making it chronologically chronologically correct and it took us through uh austin beating Shawn michaels for the wwe title uh and when i came back and all that stuff anyway uh, so that's where we ended it. Subsequently, we always had a plan for a second book because there's too many interesting things to talk about that will always be a part of the fabric of the history of, our, of pro wrestling. The Monday Night Wars, the Attitude Era, the company going public, the first XFL. You know, I got, I got the Bell's Palsy assaults that I, I had. Uh, and then, you know, being on the Raw for so many years and suddenly being taken off, after being told I wasn't, uh, things like that, uh, just explain it and how I felt at the time and what role my wife played in everything that was going along the way. You know, when you're over, when you're overweight, I'll say that I'm not, I'm not, I'll fat shame myself. I'm trying, but nonetheless, a round face Southerner with the can't smile because of Bell's palsy has a shaky footing in the, in the world of television on camera. And I always carried that with me, and it always bothered me. It ate me alive. 
So uh, all I could do is just keep working really, really hard, and, and then sometimes I got a bad hand. But then the biggest thing that happened uh, was that my wife got killed, and she got killed in March of 17. And a lot of things happened around that time, and then subsequently, you know, signed a two-year contract with WWE, then let that expire, no negotiation, we're done. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything I sincerely do. I'm not going to be a turd, uh, but I'm going to go try something else because Tony Khan wants me to play every day. And I didn't, there was no plan to, to use me in WWE. I'm not mad about it. That's their prerogative. I made a lot of money there. I'm very happy. But I had a chance to come here to AEW. And, you know, without sounding like I'm throwing WWE on the bus, I'm not, Brian. I sort of got a not. It's a breath of fresh air. It's a different presentation. The leader is 35 years old. The owner is 35 years old. That in itself gives you a different perspective. Now, some people are saying, well, that, there's what's the problem right there. Well, I'm not, when you know his background or what he does with the Jaguars or the Fulham Football Club in England, you'd be surprised at uh, what we've got here as an owner. He's pretty damn brilliant. So uh, I thought there was a need to finish the book out, get me to AEW, which sets up, if I'm a good booker or a good writer, uh, the early years of AEW somewhere down the road. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, it, was, it needed to be written, and I needed for Jan to be recognized as the asset, so a lot of us alpha male egocentric men don't think we do everything by ourselves because we don't. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that about the owner of AEW being 35 years old because, I mean, as you're well aware from, from being all over the place, I mean, the idea that Tony Khan... No experience in wrestling, aside from being like a huge fan who just kind of studied it for years and years. I mean, he stepped in there. He's half the age of Vince McMahon. And I don't have the numbers right now, but the impression that I've been given based on pre-orders and orders on Saturday is that this pay-per-view on Saturday did did very well. And oh, good. I, I haven't heard this. That's good news. That, that's, that's the impression I've been given, so don't, don't hold me to that. But I, I know that on, uh, on Saturday, <laughs> like the, the early streaming numbers were very positive. They, they were up there with, with some of the other shows that they've done. So it looks like it did well. And, Great. you know, you're talking about, you know, in April, this company, to the best of my knowledge, I mean, they made a little bit of money. And if they would have had live events and live gates, I mean, they would have made a lot of money in April. And you yeah. got to, it's just, I don't want you to sit here on the air and, and kiss Tony's ass. But, I mean, you would be a good person to ask since you've been around so many different promoters over the years. I mean, how can you explain that to fans, how, quite frankly, incredible it is that a 35-year-old guy with zero experience in pro wrestling has taken over or started this company, and within a year, I mean, there's there's network television. They're beating NXT on Wednesdays. They're profitable during a pandemic. I mean, it's 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 almost impossible to believe. We uh, we also beat Monday Night Raw a couple of times in New York City on the uh, young male demographic. I think eighteen or thirty four, eighteen or forty nine, something like that. And not so just New York. It, it, it's at least once nationally. And, well, it, it, we're, we're, look, we got we know we got a long way to go. We, we get it. We sure do. It's uh, refreshing to be here, and largely because of Tony. So I'm not going to go into some ass kissing parade here. He, you hit the nail on the head earlier, Brian, when you said he was a student of the game. That's oftentimes thrown around kind of carelessly. Not that you did, because you didn't. But he truly is a student of the game and has been his entire life. Plus, he's got a photographic memory that's scary. He, he can recite stuff I said of Mid-South in the show and when it aired and all this other stuff. And he wasn't even born yet. He studied. He's watched tapes. That's been his hobby. Then he's a, he's a, he, he manages the Fulham Football Club. He's a, a, one of the head honchos of, the, of, the, of an NFL franchise. And one of the specialties is, is, is data, all the metrics and stuff. He's amazing. With that stuff. He's the guy that finds some Un, you know, undrafted free agents in the draft because they, all the, the numbers are all in place that he was looking for. So he studies what we do. He knows what works and what doesn't work. You know, we get the minute by minutes and all that crap. Uh, so he's brilliant. He really is. And, you know, and he's learning. The great thing I like about him is that he will not make the same mistake twice on purpose. 
his ego is not so out of control that he believes there are more than one right way to get something done. And, and so he explores that. And he loves to hear the feedback from the talent. What do you want to do? Can you do this better? What would you do? And so the talents here, there are no writers. There's some coaches up with like Jerry Lynn and Dean Malenko, Billy Gunn, guys like that. But shoot, man, he's a, he's a good leader, Brian. He's a, he's a good leader. And his dad has had Tony in high level, high pressure positions, not a, not a, not a hand me down job, uh, for since he, you know, since he got out of college. So I, I, I know product knowledge. That's why he's surrounded. Look, you think Dean Lincoln's got product knowledge and Jerry Lynn and Billy Gunn and, 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 all, and all Jericho. Good Lord. There, and myself and, you know, a lot of guys. So he surrounds himself with, with people that are learned in the in that world from a variety of, of positions and facets. So I think he's a great uh, uh, owner in that regard because he listens to people. He's, he has not said over five words to me in my headset since October. He lets me write my music and sing my own music for better or for worse. I get to be me. And I, that's any performer can tell you, any announcer can tell you, I got to get a flow. I got to get a rhythm. Just like you, you got to find your rhythm and all of a sudden stuff starts falling, fall, fall together. I got to ask an impossible question here. If you could okay. tell us one thing, the biggest difference between Vince McMahon and Tony Khan what would one thing be? Vince likes doers, and Tony likes White Claw. There you go. So explain that. White Claw is a trendy young drink. Uh, well, like one of those seltzer things, I believe. I don't drink it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I go down a different road in that world. And Vince drinks doer scotch. So you got a hard scotch drinker when he drinks, which is a, a red wine. And Tony is a white claw guy. It's a generational thing, Brian. It's a generational thing. Guys in Vince in my demographic have been drinking scotch and red wine forever. And but the new kid on the block is white claw and all these seltzers you see advertised on television. And Tony's a white claw guy. It's a generational difference. One small one, but just to illustrate they're, they're born in different generations. They've had different experiences, and they have different visions. You know, uh, Tony, uh, Tony's his ability to write television is, I, I told him the other day, I said, you know, every show gets a little bit better. He, he's starting to learn all the, learn the little nuances. He's a primary driving force creator, without a doubt. And he's, I think he's doing a, a really good job, considering he's got all these other damn things on his plate. Well, stand by. We're going to head to a break. When we come back, some talk about some of the chapters in Under the Black Hat with Jim Ross here on Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Jim Ross joining us here today, Under the Black Hat, the name of his newest book. Grab it on Amazon.com as well as as JR's other... Actually, the barbecue sauce, JR, I've, I've gotten a couple of bottles and yep. uh, is it the Chipotle ketchup? Is that? Yes. Okay. My, that's my yeah. wife's favorite. And I would be remiss if I did not tell you that. She absolutely loves it. So, uh, well, let's... I'll, uh, next time you order, give me a heads up and I'll take care of you. I will. I, I will. That's what we do. I'll uh, give you the old hot tag. Yes, please. The hot hand. Yeah, yeah I've got it. And the thing about that Chipotle ketchup. If you put a little bit of it in a ramekin and put it in the microwave for 10 seconds, something like that, it warms it up, obviously, but it makes a really good steak sauce. There you go. So it's uh, interesting. That's jrsbbq.com, folks. Barbecue sauce. I got it off. I feel like a, a southern snake oil. But I'm not snake it's oil. not snake oil. Mom and, yeah, Mom and Jan developed a lot of that stuff. And that, uh, you know, the uh, jalapeno honey much has got one gram of sugar, I think. So it's healthy as heck. and. And you can also get the autograph copy of the book there. So check us out. We appreciate your business, quite frankly. Jan is a thread that runs through the entire book. I mean, virtually every single... And there's a lot of very short chapters. It's not like, uh, you know, the, the book is five chapters long. It's, I mean, there's just so much to cover. But in, in virtually every chapter, I mean, there's that note about Jan and your memories of Jan during that period. 
And yeah. that that's really the story of, of the entire book. And, you know, I don't want to dwell on it too much here, but, I mean, I guess one question. You know, when this first happened, I, I remember a lot of details about that period pretty vividly. And you, you like, were immediately getting back to work. And obviously, you know, I guess the idea, and you could tell everybody, but I mean, the idea being that you just got to get back to work. That That's going to be the, yeah. the easiest way for you to deal with this. And everybody deals with grieving in a different way. And looking back the last two, three years, I mean, are you confident that that was the right decision? How much did that help to just get right back to work? Oh, it helped me a lot. Brian, you're you're spot on. I I had to get had to get out of that empty house. You know, ironically, sadly, uh, four days after Jan got killed, maybe five, four or five, not many. Uh, I went to Orlando. I had some shows in Orlando, uh, my, the, the, the Jr. Stage Show deals, Q and A and stuff. And then also on Saturday before WrestleMania that weekend, signed a, con- a two year contract. And I, then I called uh, or help call. Uh, I was a sidekick, which was great, as she said, uh, for the Undertaker, I think, Roman Reigns match. So uh, it was a whirlwind deal. But then during that time I was in Orlando, Jan's cat died. He couldn't find her. I, had, I even had an autopsy. Uh, the doctor said, the only thing I can tell you, seriously, he, has, he, he, saw, he had too much anxiety and it, it killed himself. Type of thing. That's like, my God. It's what else is going to happen? And wasn't the cat underneath the bed where Jan slept? Yeah, she was under the bed on on his, on her side. That's where my guy that was taking care of my house found him. Mickey, Mickey the cat. Uh, so Mickey the cat's ashes are on the mantel, and uh, so you know he's he's he he kind of keeps things he babysits me. But I'm an alpha guy, alpha male kind of guy. I like to be around people. I like to be involved. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now, I, I, which I love, by the way. But I couldn't handle the the isolation. I didn't handle the uh, being alone. I didn't want to even draw my blinds. I got these wooden blinds in my house. They, all of them are shut. And uh, I, I got to feel like I was going to be somebody like uh, Howard Hughes. My fingernails are going to get long and my beard is going to grow. Uh, so anyway, uh, I had to do something because wasn't, it wasn't healthy for me. I when I'm left alone in that distress and that anxiety, Brian, and full disclosure, because I am going to be, till I die, a man's man, uh, JR doesn't always make their best decisions when left to his own devices in an altered state. And, man, my state was as altered as it could be. I lost my lover, my wife. You know, we were together over 25 years. Through everything, getting fired at WWE. She went through the whole nine yards, man. We got married in '93, so and and I got fired the first time in '93. So it was going back and then coming back to Atlanta. It was a mess. And she stood by me the whole damn time. All my illnesses, you know. She she spotted that I had. She told my doctor he he stops breathing at night and he's got his hand on his hip like he's in a meeting and he stops breathing. They find out I got sleep apnea. I stopped breathing 66 times in an hour. She saved my life. I'm a dead duck if I don't get that diagnosed. So it's a lot of things like that. And I just think that sometimes the, the, the significant others in our lives play such a vital role. And some of us, and looking at myself here, are too damn headstrong, uh, arrogant uh, uh, to admit it. So there's a, a, a buddy of mine bought the book, and he was out of town. The book came. His wife started reading it. She wouldn't give it back to him until she was finished with it. And she said, I, I just read a, an amazing love story. And Brian, I'll tell you, you know me for a long time. My, I, I, I'm not good at a lot of things, so I'm sure writing a love story is one of them. So, but anyway, it touched a lot of females. You know, selfishly, one of the things that I love about the book is we did a long series looking at the Monday Night Wars, rewatched every single one of the Raw Nitro shows, which... I don't know what I was thinking when I started, but we finished a couple of, uh, about a month ago, and so everybody wanted us to continue, so we continued with the Raw after WrestleMania X7, and I pick up your book, and I mean, it's everything that I've just been watching, so it was fascinating, 
Brawl for All, Bard Gun, Austin Turning Heel. I mean, there's there's so much. I, I just watched it. I'm reading your thoughts on all of it. So selfishly, like the first half of the book is it was like it was written for me. So I was very appreciative of that. But you know, one oh, thing I good. wanted to uh to ask you about here was Steve Austin turns heel at WrestleMania X7. And the SmackDown after that WrestleMania is the show where you and him are in the ring together and he yeah. beats the hell out of you and he cuts you with like a scalpel. Okay? Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, super, that's super where we, where we all on that deal. <laughs> that was crazy. Okay, so so now when I was young, I was very stupid, and when I did backyard wrestling, I only knew what blading was, but I didn't know what an actual blade was. So I, in yeah. fact, once cut myself with an exacto knife, which was exceedingly <laughs> stupid. So when I'm reading this book, and and Steve Austin is like, I I got a scalpel from the building. I'm like a scalpel, like w- what? It's 2001. I mean, it's a billion-dollar company, or it's on its way there. It's gone public. Like, nobody could find the proper blade to cut JR. Oh, they didn't find one. They just want to make sure that I got put in juice. Oh, and my. Because the, uh, uh, I mean, there were a lot of guys had well, had blades. You know, Arn Anderson always made, made my blades and uh, when I had to do something. Because I always got beat up, and I generally got bloody more often than not. Uh, but nonetheless, no big deal. That's how it was cast. That's how the play was written that week, the, the senior drama class, uh, or whatever. Well, uh, but yeah, it, it was. Uh, I, I was. Look, I didn't even look at the scalpel. It's like getting a. It's like somebody when you when you give blood. I oh God, I wouldn't have looked at it either. So uh, anyway, it, yeah, it was a. Uh, it accomplished the mission of getting a proper uh, dramatic effect, but it didn't accomplish anything of making Steve a heel. People well, loved him. They still they still loved him. They and they will always love it. Yes. Now, ironically, I just watched that show one week ago today. That SmackDown where you guys had that confrontation, and we all are well aware. And you write in the book that you knew this going in that this is a bad idea. And Vince, <laughs> yeah. Vince wasn't really down with it, but he felt that he owed it to Steve. And so they pulled the trigger and Steve Austin turned heel. And we know, because this was 20 years ago, that in fact, you were right and Vince was right and everybody else was right that this was a terrible idea. But this segment with you and Steve Austin, and I'm not just saying this because you were on the air, this segment was so great. And you and Steve, like, it was perfect. He was the, like, as a as a character, okay, he was the greatest heel. He was so unlikable. The the byplay between you two was so great. The the beating was so vicious. Vince is so awesome telling him to lay it in, Steve. I mean, it was so good, but like as a business move, it was so bad. So I just want to give you a chance to kind of talk about like Steve's ability to be a heel versus how bad it actually was as a business idea. Well, gosh, there's a lot to talk about in that regard. The Vince's yelling, open him up, was the cue for the audience to turn their head to Vince. It was a misdirection. Man, and when he did, that's when I got cut. So that's that's how that worked out. That was the deal there when he screamed down there, open him up. Uh, Austin put more knots in my head than you can ever imagine. I said, what? Is that how you work with everybody? I said, that's total crap. You know, I was, I was frustrated. I, I, I was, my heart was beating about a zillion miles an hour, you can imagine. And he said, well, we had, we had, had late ends, live TV. I said, it's taped. It's SmackDown. <laughs> it's a taped show. He laughed. He laughed. So anyway, uh, the deal was, look, Austin was John Wayne. And you notice that all the smart bookers, i.e. producers, directors, like uh, Henry uh, Howard Hawks and John Ford, all these dudes, with all these Oscars, never booked John Wayne as a heel. The audience would spit it right back at you. Okay. We understand he's making a movie, but we don't like it. And I think that, that's how I felt about Steve. I know it's an antiquated analogy, but he was our John Wayne. He was universally loved for his courage and his defiance, his you know, anti establishment stuff. People loved him, they could identify. So but here's the thing. We did owe it to Steve to try it. He wanted to try it. And sometimes when you got a talent that has contributed as much as he has 
and still does, by the way. Uh, you, 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 you want to try their ideas, even though they may be bold and, and out there a little bit. But he earned that right to, to try. And so for that reason, I had no issue going along with it. I just thought at the end of the day it wasn't going to work because people loved him too much. You know, here's a question. Here's a hypothetical here. So the Raw after WrestleMania, they do a rematch with Austin and Rock in a cage. And basically Triple H shows up and Triple H and Austin destroy the Rock and they bloody him up and they beat on him. And he leaves. He leaves the company for a little while. Do you think that if Rock would have been there as a regular to take that spot as the top babyface, this might have worked out a little better? Because the way it worked well, out, well, Steve turned heel, Hunter's heel. You he really had no top babyface at the time because Rock also left at that same time. Exactly. And it was always set up for if Steve wanted. We all knew, look. Steve wanted to be a heel was no, no, well, wow, I didn't know you had that in your mind. He, he talked about it all the time. He liked being a heel. It was fun for him. And he was great he's at very, it. He's, he's, and he's played a character. He, he liked that role of the villain. Uh, but I think that, like anybody else, he liked the role of getting those massive royalty checks even more. I would. So, uh, but if they set up for Austin and Rock. Uh, Rock had his heel run. You have a whole different series of matches, different positions. You know as well as I do that if you have a quality guy like Rock, one of the greatest of all time, and he and Austin, Rock was the flag bearer. He was the top of the babyface mountain. The damn thing would have worked. It would have worked. Because those two guys would not have allowed it to fail. You know, the it was very interesting reading the uh, chapter. We, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but, you know, right around that time, I'll just throw this out very quickly. The XFL uh, kicked off, and then it died. And you note in the book that Vince seemed to carry that around, even though he wouldn't talk about it publicly. And how ironic that uh, 20 years later, he, in fact, was still carrying it around. But we have to head to a break. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, a Wrestling Observer Live. Jim Ross, under the black hat, available at Amazon.com. Find booksellers, his website for autographed copies. Jim, we got about 60 seconds. You're a professional. Here we go. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. It was a big week for us, coming off a big win on Saturday night. Uh, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, 7 Central on TNT, AEW Dynamite. Mike Tyson's going to drop by. And i got a sneaky feeling there's going to be something uh, right-handed in that situation, but we'll wait and see. Uh, so that's going to be a big week for us. Uh, and I'm excited about that. We do TV again on Thursday for next Wednesday. Then I'm going home Friday, finally, after I've been here a month uh, here in uh, Neptune Beach. So Tony Khan said, very good care of me here. Again, I didn't stay at the hotel in the high-risk group. So I, even though everybody's been tested, we're good. So I appreciate the business and the shout-out at jrsbbq.com. We'll be happy to ship you some barbecue sauce, ketchup, and mustard, seasoning, whatever you want. And those books are there uh, awaiting. And when I get home this weekend, I'm signing a bunch of books. The orders have come in since I've been gone, which is, seems like forever, but it's, it's been a fun little trip. Well, check it out, jrsbbq.com. You can get autographed copies of the book and, and everything else. The barbecue sauce, the chipotle ketchup, I believe, is, is my wife's favorite, and so much more. And, Jim, I want to thank you so much for doing the show here today, and we need to do it again. I got one thing on my gigantic list here of questions for you, so another time. Okay. Anytime, buddy. Anytime. I, I enjoyed I enjoy this with you. Well, thanks again, and, of course, thanks, everybody, for listening. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sundays, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturdays, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern with Jim Valley, and we are out of time. I want to thank all you for listening. Everybody on Twitch, Sports Byline. We'll talk to you again next time, Wrestling Observer Live.